Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Rewriting History, a battle between facts and fiction, a discussion on historical fiction. As I had mentioned earlier, as, I, as we concluded the last chapter on our discussion on literature, that this week onwards, moving forward, we will be deep diving into different genres of literature. And today, the topic that we've picked is historical fiction. Before I move ahead in this discussion, I'd like to introduce my panel to you this evening. Joining me from Bangalore is my constant panelist, Abhinav Bhattacharya, who is, a, who is a published author and an IT professional. And joining us is a very special guest this weekend, this evening, is Mansoor Rahman. Hello. Hello, Mansoor. How are you this evening? I'm doing good. How are you, Akashdeep? I'm doing good. Thank you. Uh, so I'd like, uh, Mansoor, would you like to introduce yourself to our viewers? Uh, sure. So I'm Mansoor. I am originally from Gahati, Assam, and I did my schooling there uh, in Don Bosco and Cotton College before I moved to do my engineering here in Bangalore, where I'm uh, currently reside. And uh, I've uh, been an IT consultant for half a dozen years, and then been a bit of a startup entrepreneur. Before I've, uh, you know, uh, now I head business uh, at a bars, a video streaming platform. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, so, as I already mentioned, the topic for discussion this weekend is historical fiction. Uh, so, uh, would you, I would just like to request uh, both of you to just come ahead and uh, give your views on what the genre is. Give an introduction of the genre. We'll begin with you, Abhinav. Sure, Akashdeep. So, it's a massive genre itself, uh, historical fiction, uh, to be precise. And uh, anything a few years back is history. Uh, so definitely, I, I would say that now molding that fictional elements around it from any facet of time uh, in the past is something which this genre is all about. And it demands more than that, just that. I mean, and uh, it stands for the events which you know, could have occurred and people portrayed who could have lived uh, even longer. So it's a massive genre in, the, in itself, and I feel that the fundamental sign, the fact that. The, most popular writers of uh, you know, history always uphold about the seven key elements of historical fiction, uh, namely, uh, you know, characters, dialogue, plot, conflict, uh, theme, setting, and finally, the most important part would be, you know, world building. So, but then there are subgenres within it, which makes it even diverse and unique. Uh, you can have, you know, writers write historical fantasy, which I did with my first book, uh, The Full Run of Hope. And uh, which is unique and uh, in itself, and then you can have you know historical romance, and TV dramas. I think uh, the uh, entire you know the book industry has a lot of you know period dramas all together since the birth of you know novels uh, in itself, or in the, towards the birth of you know uh, historical fiction itself. So the list goes on. The period dramas have been always been you know a constant there, and uh, that's me. Uh, on my take in terms of the fundamentals. Uh, Mansoor, your views on the fundamentals of historical fiction. Right. Uh, I think Avinash has covered it pretty well. Uh, so basically, historical fiction generally is set in the past and it pays attention to the manners, the social conditions, and uh, you know, other details of that depicted period. And uh, also, in general, you know, uh, around 50 to 70 years have passed since. Uh, the uh, time of that uh, period, you know, uh, and uh, coming to these elements that uh, we have also mentioned upon, I would probably uh, like to mention uh, specifically about uh, uh, the plot, for instance. And it's important that in historical fiction, the plot has a certain uh, connection to the events that have taken place during that uh, time frame. So if it's a historical fiction that deals with, uh, you know, the 1939 to 1945 period, let's say, uh, and set in the World War II. So then, you know, uh, something uh, that happens or occurs, the events of that should play a central or at least a major chunk of uh, the plot in the novel as akin to, you know, uh, something that is uh, just set in that period but has no real connection to it. Okay. Thank you so much of you for giving us a brief overview of the fundamentals of historical fiction. Uh, moving on to the next question, uh, historical fiction, on how did you get introduced to it? 
Yeah, I do read uh, a lot of historical fiction these days, but not as much, I would say, uh, uh, when I used to read more of, I think, I feel I read more of Udanets or any crime fiction to be precise, which is quite, you know, in popular terms, you know, it's quite, uh, you know, diverse in itself. But then, yeah, I guess it, uh, maybe I was introduced to more of uh, that, uh, basically around, you know, historical fiction as a genre, you know, in the, in the latter part of my life, or uh, because, but yeah, uh, better late than never. And I do read a lot of historical fiction these days, especially. And the first would be uh, the legendary, you know, Leo Tolstoy's War and Peace. It was an epic almost. Uh, uh, it broadly focuses on Napoleon's uh, invasion of Russia back in, uh, you know, 1812 and revolves around three of the most well known characters in literature today. And it was pure and with all the boxes I have mentioned around the key elements of historical fiction, especially world building. So that, that is, I think, the first, you know, historical fiction which I read back in my V days. And it really, you know, stayed with me. Okay. Uh, Mansoor, what about you? Uh, right. So uh, I, I don't read as much as I would have liked. Uh, I used to earlier, but now I stick with a little of nonfiction. But uh, yeah, I did get introduced to it uh, quite early during school uh, when, you know, I read the, A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. And I think it was a, a great introduction to historical fiction because it took place in such a tumultuous time, right? Uh, it was the French Revolution uh, when uh, the Republicans were basically taking over and uh, setting, sending the aristocrats, the royals, uh, to the gulletin. And uh, the entire setting was uh, so well done, so well portrayed by uh, Dickens. Uh, you could uh, really feel the, you know, the, the entire anxiety, the fear uh, that was there, palpable amongst the population, amongst the aristocracy. And uh, there are these scenes uh, where the uh, local populace storms the you know, uh, walls of the Bastille, which is the jail, right? Where they, where they were putting up all these aristocrats and they're dragging them out and getting them to be beheaded in the gulletin. And I, I, th I just, just, just got hooked onto it. And uh, since then, of course, I've devoured a lot. And, uh, you know, uh, a special mention I have to make of uh, a hunchback, The Hunchback of Notre Dame by Victor Hugo which also touches upon the same period uh, during the French uh, Revolution time. Uh, yeah, so yeah, that's, how, that's basically how I got introduced and uh, you know, what I think of it. Okay, thank you. Uh, since we're talking about this genre and both of you are avid readers, uh, will it be possible for you to you know, put, a, put, a, put your finger over your top, your favorite historical fiction novels and your favorite novelists? I'll begin with you, Avina. Yeah, oh yeah, uh, Agasti, the top of the list would always be, you know, 100 Years of Solitude by the you know, famous Gabriel Garcia Marquez. It's a period drama again. Wow, that's my mm -hmm. word for it. Uh, what a book in itself. And uh, it's very religi religiously read across the globe. That's one of the most, uh, you know, reads I've seen as a book across the globe and but yeah I, I would also like to give you mention you know Leon Yuri for his Mila 18 Topaz and Armageddon. Uh, interesting phase in history he had picked for each of these three books and gripping novels honestly and uh, wonderful reads and all of them and interestingly he had picked uh, you know his creative angle towards writing for TV drama so especially uh, that he had picked certain very key elements of, uh, you know, in terms of world time and how the world building should happen. It was quite creative and I really liked the three books. And uh, so that's my top picks, I would say, overall in terms of historical fiction. Okay. Uh, Mansoor, your top five, uh, I mean, your favorite uh, historical fiction novels and historical fiction novelists. Okay. Uh, so I guess, uh, as I've already mentioned earlier, uh, The Hunchback of Notre Dame uh, definitely counts as one of my favorites. Uh, it touches upon so many things that uh, while it might be very familiar to us right now, when we talk of racism and we talk about diversity, it, it's part of our, uh, you know, uh, everyday conversation. But think about it, you know, 200, 200, 300 years back, 
uh, when it's a Eurocentric population and uh, the central characters in that uh, novel are uh, somebody who is uh, uh, disfigured, you know. Uh, then there's a, a girl called Esmeralda who is a uh, half uh, mixed race uh, girl. She's uh, described as dark skin uh, and Romani, right, a, a gypsy girl. And uh, it touches on these topics and does such, uh, uh, you know, beautiful justice to the, to the deftness of the entire plot, right? Uh, so yeah, it remains a favorite. Uh, in addition to that, I am also a big history buff. So I like uh, novels which touch different kinds of cultures and different kinds of time periods. So there's a Shogun by James Clavell, which is, uh, you know, the Japanese tradition of samurais and the uh, Shogun, you know, which was the head of the samurai essentially. The noble families, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a clash between two noble families and uh, the plot revolves around that. But uh, definitely it's a, you know, uh, it has all the settings of the Japanese uh, samurai culture. Uh, it's quite a humongous read. And then of course, uh, there's a very famous, uh, I mean, I wouldn't call it uh, very well known, but it's still famous because of the, for its really uh, amazing, uh, you know, touches. Uh, it's called uh, A Rising Man by Abir Mukherjee. It's set in 1900s in Kolkata. And it gives that yeah. great feeling, you know, uh, of, of the uh, 1900s Kolkata. And you can mm -hmm. actually feel it like a black and white movie. Uh, yeah. And although the central premise is a thriller, it's definitely one to, to read to get an idea of, of the time period. Exactly. Uh, other than that, of course, uh, I think um, there's a very recent one. I mean, recent is probably like uh, 12, 13 years ago. But I loved it. It's probably not, uh, you know, uh, very well known in terms of, uh, you know, literature. But I like it because it uh, it was fun and it was made into a movie. It's called the Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society. It's mm -hmm. a World War II novel which covers the uh, Nazi occupation of the Guernsey Island, uh, which was the only British territory that was, uh, you know, occupied by the German Nazi forces. And uh, yeah, I mean, if you can read it, definitely do. I think it's a fun read. And the movie was pretty well done too. Totally. Okay. Thank, thank you for sharing your inputs on that. Uh, that brings me to my next question. Uh, whenever we talk about historical fiction, there is this inevitable angle of creative liberty, which many novelists have taken so far. But sometimes... It's, it has been observed in different novels and in different arenas of literature that they often stretch it too far. They often cross the line and you know, the line between fact and fiction is blurred. What are your views on the creative liberties which are taken by novelists whenever they start scripting a historical fiction novel? I mean, uh, Extremely important question, uh, Akashdeep. And what I would like to start with is also I would like to answer this in two phases. One, yeah. in the first phase, I would like to mention that some, just to show out how uh, you know, creative liberty is a whole new ball game, and it's always had been there, but should have been utilized in the right way. So one is uh, some critics claim that uh, Arundhati Roy's The God of Small Things is a period drama. Well, if you see from that angle, yes. Uh, uh, but I believe it's pure drama and much more focus into a, you know, a thick plot and character play. It's a masterpiece, but I would argue if it can just be called a period drama. But overall, if you see, it was so well written, you know, uh, in terms of creati uh, creative liberty. They had explored it so much that it could be, you know, even tagged as a period drama today. But again, uh, as I mentioned, I think uh, I had mentioned earlier about world building, which is very key to a writer's forte. Some exploit it by removing the thin line between the thin lines between you know uh, history and mythology. I believe a lot of Indian and foreign writers of recent times, especially Indian though, uh, yeah. have exploited that angle to get maybe a bit more masala out of it by being controversial. I don't see eye to eye on it. Uh, it's also a writer's job to you know entertain readers on a positive note. I feel, and there is already a lot of disbelief in this world. So just sticking to the right notes also helps, you know, the whole global mass as well. And moreover, I see a lot of writers writing a massive amount of mythological fiction. Uh, 
uh, you know, and especially mythological fantasy fiction. It's like taking a piece out of a, you know, religious artifact and twisting a plot of it, out of it. I don't see orig originality in it. And uh, but what, what can I say? But uh, people have their opinions and uh, writers have different dreams. You know? That's all I can say. Yeah. Definitely, writers have their own dreams. And sometimes dreams overshadow everything else. Exactly. Uh, one, and exactly, uh, one, one, one. mentioned before as well in the couple of books about, you know, how the drama about, you know, just Kolkata came out. So, right, that, that was one of the best books I have read so far in terms of, you know, period dramas. So, that's something which Creative Liberty should be about instead of just, you know, taking a piece from here and then manipulating it. Well, that's how it is done for some people. That's how some people prefer doing it. Uh, Mansoor, your views on this? Uh, yeah, Akash Deep. I think it's a very interesting point. I think uh, I am uh, from the camp which believes that uh, an, uh, an author is nothing different uh, from an artist, uh, nothing different from a painter, a musician, right? Uh, in, in, in the sense that there is a, a creativeness inside of them that they need to express. And uh, every, every writer, every artist, every musician is unique because the voice inside of that then is unique. And it needs to be said. Whether it's received well or not is secondary. It needs to be said because it is that personal uh, expression of that creativeness. Uh, and so, you know, when we look at some, something like uh, Salman Rushdie's, uh, you know, uh, Satanic Verses, you know, there's a magic surrealism that is, you know, very well known for. And those wouldn't appear if, if, if they don't take the creative liberty that they do need to do, right? Now, having said that, you know, having said that, we live today in a post-truth world. And, uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. and this, this, this uh, the creative liberty that is being taken uh, is often twisted to kind of drive narratives, drive propaganda. Uh, and in a nation, especially our kind of nation where perhaps critical reasoning and literacy is not the biggest, the strongest point uh, that we have, it, it blurs those lines. And people kind of start believing instead of understanding that it's more of a you know, literary creativeness. And that is where I think the author needs to uh, exercise some kind of responsibility. He owes yeah. it to his people, to his readers, to, yeah. be, to be always mindful of that. Totally. Uh, okay, so this actually highlights the uh, topic of this discussion, that there's a battle between facts and fiction. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, just, it just reminded me of an incident which happened like uh, close to two and a half years back. This was not about a book, but it was about a movie. Uh, the movie I'm talking about is Padmavat, which was based on, on, which is kind of a work of historical fiction. And we all know how things turned out for that movie. How people went mad just because of a few, few, you know, I wouldn't say, I don't know if you should call it rumors or baseless propaganda or whatever you call it, but it, it had actually, you know, faced a lot of heat because of some some of the things that happened back then. Exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's very interestingly, I was in Gurgaon during that time, and I remember, you know, I was trying to book a cab, and I couldn't get any cabs uh, because they were just too afraid uh, to, that they would get damaged or, you know, uh, there would be yeah. um, mob violence. So yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it's quite sad. interesting, though. This is quite interesting because. Uh, I feel that, that, that the whole point about creative li li uh, liberty and how you control it is very important. And I think uh, what Mansoor has mentioned and you have mentioned is quite, you know, key yeah. to the whole conversation altogether and how, you know, writers come up in the next, you know, decade and ahead, basically. And I think uh, um, even like Avinav has mentioned, right? I mean, uh, there's no originality if you just pick up something from that's already there. That's so well known. That's been there for <laughs> what five thousand, six thousand years. Uh, you know, where, whereas there are stories that are still uh, so fresh, things that have not been yeah. explored. I mean, and uh, speaking from an Indian Indian context and as a northeastern, I yeah. think uh, 
there are uh, so few books that touch upon the you know uh, the times when let's say the US Air Force was based out of Assam and had to supply yeah. you know war materials uh, yeah. to China you know uh, to to keep uh, to keep the Japanese forces uh, occupied and uh, there's there's this very interesting story where the president uh, you know uh, Franklin Roosevelt uh, yeah. has a note a memo written where he says that the war in china must continue at all cost and we must you know keep sending supplies even though it was costing them a hell of a lot exactly so there are so many stories like this like i mean this is just one you know in, the, in during the world war time uh, even uh, if you move uh, if, even if you digress from this there are a lot of stories about the northeast which but i mean there are no takers sadly like, nobody wants to do anything on that uh we'll we'll uh, talk discuss this some other time because there's a lot to discuss here as well uh moving on to the next question uh, your top 5 favorite historical fiction novels and novelists i mean um yeah sure and uh, akashdeep i think i have already mentioned uh, you know my top take would be always you know gabriel garcia or marquez's uh, the 100 years of uh, but also the rest would be i would say closely followed by Uh, would uh, hilary mentions uh, a book basically around uh, that and uh, it's of course definitely up there the others would be the other bullion girl by philippa gregory uh, is about an intricate you know power struggle between two ladies for catching the attention of you know henry the 8th and uh, possibly a taste of the throne as well and it's quite stark a drama but again it's a period drama so uh, it's quite classic in itself another classic i would like to mention is of course what uh, uh, i think mansur has also mentioned tale of two cities by uh, charles dickens i must read and up there always and the final one i would like to uh, you know dedicate uh, this that the book thief by marcus zusak zusak uh, world war 2 classic which is is something which shows another period drama during torrid times It was quite well written. I mean, just to show about uh, how you know uh, tense the situation was and how you know intricately it was written, to just show how people were during that period of time, on or how people you know cooperated with the entire society or worked together in terms of uh, you know that uh, during the times of Franklin, I would say, and that's something I really like. So that's. my takes the top takes for today okay uh, what about you mansoor uh my top takes are as i've already mentioned uh, you know a rising man by abir mukherjee the hunchback of notre dame by victor hugo uh then there's of course uh, the shogun as i mentioned again uh, james clavell uh, all of these are you know so set in such different time periods and in different different geographies uh and, and it's very interesting and uh, there's of course i i think i miss uh, need to mention the the name of the rose by umberto eco which is uh, yeah. an italian based in italy in the 1300s pre renaissance uh very very beautifully done the setting you can you you know uh, you can really get a feel of the, the you know uh, italian landscape and the the time period and the political intrigue that that's there you know uh so yeah uh, and then finally of course uh, this uh, latest one which is uh, the gonse literary and potato peel by society but yeah okay okay that's interesting uh since both of you are such voracious readers that just makes me wonder like and just want to ask you are you guys a part of any literary outfit or organization i mean of Oh yeah, I am, and I am proud to be a part of the Whitefield Literary Society. Uh, it's a great honor to have our, you know, president, and a key founder, you know, Mansoor today with us. It was a dream of his to form a quintessential, you know, literary society during these times of tranquil and you know digital overshadow, as we call it. Uh, you know, uh, it's a great forum for fellow writers, authors, historians, and you know, enthusiasts who eat, sleep, and you know, breathe books. Yeah. something which i had to mention and yeah this is a uh, you know a society wherein it will always be there uh, in terms of, and upheld you know good writers or even uh, new writers who are coming into the picture and 
it's a great society uh, to be with as a part of uh, you know the bangalore literary arena and now uh, even if you consider the lit fest which happened uh, throughout you know bangalore even uh, nowadays it's quite a good engagement but then it's just once a year so the society is something which is always there a constant uh, it is quite great to have this particular society up and running and really proud to be a part of it okay mansoor uh yeah kartik uh, so uh, as as of enough mentioned we part of the white hill literary society and uh, it, uh, the whole idea is to bring together bibliophiles and uh, anybody who's basically interested in any kind of literature and even culture or art uh, and bring them together have discussions uh, uh read out expert uh, you know uh, from different different books uh, and you know basically interact and and you know uh, help each other grow uh in terms of uh, our literary knowledge in terms of uh, the kind of uh, reading that we get and uh, i think especially in a covid world where earlier there would be book clubs so we used to have lot of book clubs uh bangalore uh, here has a very uh, great uh, you know community of book lovers uh, centered around the famous uh, blossom book store uh, in church street and yeah. uh, there have been also a chain of libraries like just books and others that have opened up across the city but in the post covid world i think uh, you know uh, these things have taken a bit of a uh, downturn and so we we still have the tools right now we are chatting here on zoom uh, you know and uh, there's no reason why we can't continue having our discussions and and you know hunting our literary selves over the same technological tools exactly yeah yeah no this too shall pass the the covid 19 is not going to last forever and i'm pretty sure after the dust settles on this people will be back out with books in their hands exchanging and spreading the wisdom uh that I sure uh, hope so. yeah i hope so uh that brings me to my last question for this discussion what are you currently reading abhinav yeah so i'm on to this one for uh, this particular week uh, it's a historical non fiction though interesting and uh, this is by you know uh, william dagan called it's called the mass mogul and uh, yeah. also the crazy fact that he always has this you know massive dramatic persona which is almost like yeah. a, the book the dartmouth detailing has been done uh, to this book itself and i believe like yeah. this is something which he is you know stand, uh, completely standing out for and i really like his non fiction book this is the only type of non fiction which i can you know digest in terms of history yeah. and uh, uh, if you consider all of his books they have really like the amount of dramatis personae what he actually puts it up there and the mentions the special mentions of the pre period basically it's quite quite great in terms of research and I don't think so. There is any other, you know, book writer who has done so much research and then put so much effort before, you know, writing the book. So that's something which I, I'm really uh, proud to be even reading today. So that's yeah. Me. William Dalrymple is amazing. Yeah. Uh, Mansoor, I'll give you the final words for this discussion. What are you currently reading? Right. Uh, so uh, very coincidentally, I'm also reading a book by William Dalrymple. It's the Anarchy. uh which is basically an account of how the british east india company uh you know became the uh, controlling company from just a small trading firm uh, over yeah. the course of a few hundred years and it's yeah. uh, i think uh, every indian who who can should definitely go have a read at it to understand um how uh, societies uh you know uh, was split and uh, you know Uh, community set against each other taken advantage of and made to surrender i think uh, you know uh, there's a saying right uh, those who do not learn from history are bound to repeat it and, and i yes, think that stands to be today yes. yeah i i think uh, we sh- we should uh, definitely read this history because we we need to know how not to divide ourselves totally i believe you mansoor on this and uh, so that's about period dramas and not only period dramas i mean how you know writers actually do the world building basically and i really like some of the writers who really take care while even doing their research so that's yeah 
it's up to okay uh, on that note i'd like to thank both of you abhinav and mansoor for joining me on this discussion on historical fiction this week thank you so much stay home stay safe hey yeah, thanks stay home thank you thank you and yeah. okay. stay safe bye guys